I helped create a monster because now the average consumer is getting inundated with text messages just like they are getting, and everything we did was opt-in. So I don't want you to think we're spamming. Everything oh, yeah. was yeah. text into join, text into join, text out if you don't want it. It was all opt-in. I couldn't sleep at night if it wasn't. But um, we helped create a monster. On today's episode of Rise, Garn, Repeat, we talk to David from Handwritten. We talk about how his company is building robots to make personalized handwritten notes. Let's dive right in. David, thank you so much for uh, joining on another episode of Rise, Grind, Repeat. Um, I'm excited about this, like we were talking just before this. I mean, one of your competitors, it, it caught my eye. It's a tactic uh, that I think um, is, there, there's so much opportunity in this space. Um, but before we get into the the having fun, nerding out, and really talking about personalization and digital communication, love to just hear a little bit about you. What's your past, and how did you uh, how did you start handwritten? Yeah, and it all kind of plays together. So thank you um, for having me on. This is super cool, especially since it's a local show. I'm I'm here in Phoenix, so uh, thank you for having me on. Um, so my background is I was always wanting to start a company. Back when I was in preschool, I used to walk, like my brother had one of those red wagons. Um, I, I think it was a Jeffrey wagon or something. Mm -hmm. And I would steal it, take it out, filled with candy that my mom bought at, at Price Club. It wasn't even called Costco then. And sell it door to door. Um, and that was kind of my first business. One day I didn't have any candy. So I scoured the house and the only thing I could find was the first aid kit. So I put that in the wagon and I went door to door asking if anybody was having an emergency and people were kind enough to say, try back later. So, you know, a three-year-old that walks to your door, it was different times, you know, child molestation wasn't as big of an issue, but then I, um, grew up in high school. I started a company here in Scottsdale, Arizona mm -hmm. that built and sold computers. And then I went off to call it. I mean, clearly I'm a nerd. Um, I went off to college and I studied um, finance, entrepreneurial management, and then in the engineering school, I, uh, I dual degree in engineering and business, and in the engineering school, I chose computer science. One of the reasons I did that is because I knew that when I wanted to start a company, it's a lot easier to start a software company than a semiconductor company, <laughs> or yeah. you know what I mean? Like, there's just way less CapEx, so yep. even back 20 four years ago, 25 years ago, I, I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Um, then what happened was I came out of school. I actually took five years to get through that program. I came out of school um, and A, I had a bunch of school debt, which kind of makes it hard to start a company. And B, there were, it was in the go-go 2000s. I think you're a little bit younger than me, but back in 2000, it was the dot-com boom and oh. things were going bonkers and people were throwing money at you to join these things. So I joined a company called Diamond Cluster, which is a consulting firm that worked with big, uh, you know, Inc. 100 or Fortune 100 companies to make them more dot com -y, uh, <laughs> which sounded great, but yeah. in reality, it was just BS. Um, <laughs> and uh, I did that for a couple of years. And then I went into investment banking for a couple of years. And I always wanted to do entrepreneurship or venture capital. So I actually went out to San Diego to work for a venture capital firm. And it's a best, it's a story best told over beers, <laughs> but the guy was nuts. Uh, really? It was a weird firm to begin with. I had actually turned them down a year before and then went to work at an investment bank. And then a year later they called me up and they said, we wish you'd reconsider. And I was miserable at the investment bank. So I was like, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> so I went out there within like four months, I was fired. And it was the weirdest four months of my life. Like, here I am, I went to an Ivy League school. So I kind of had a better than you attitude, which is not right. But you know, I was yeah. like, what the hell are you doing? And he's having me move truck tires around, like he buy a, <laughs> um, a G wagon, or whatever, he bought this, G and then he'd order tires on tire .com. And then here I am this kid that's trying to get into venture capital, just worked at an investment <laughs> bank. And he's like, go out and Move, move, shuttle around these truck tires I just bought on TireRack.com. So that was weird. And then he bugged my office for no reason. Really? And I, that is that's yeah. really weird. Yeah, I was sitting in my office late at night working on a presentation, and I see this garden owl, like what you'd see 
to scare away critters. Uh And it's like right outside my office looking at me. And I'm looking at this stupid garden owl. I'm like, I'll be damned if there's a camera in that garden owl. So I walk over to it. I lift it up. and There's like a webcam in there. I'm like, you. No way. Yeah, it was just stupid. It was stupid. My entire experience in San Diego was not great, unfortunately. (laughs) Um, It should have been, but it was not great. So anyway, then he blamed some stock transaction on me. And he fired me without cause, or I guess his cause was a stock transaction, but it was made up. Mm-hmm. And uh, I uh, didn't know what to do because prior to that, I had these pretty cushy jobs and I would use all the money from those jobs to pay down school debt. Uh, and I had a lot of school debt, but I paid it pretty much all down. But at the same time, I didn't have any nest egg. Yeah. I didn't have any um, safety egg to support me. So, um, this was back in 2004 and, um, before the iPhone and my family, I grew up in Phoenix. So, uh, my dad, because I was just, I don't know, 24 at the time, um, my dad drove out from Phoenix to pack me up and move me back to Phoenix and we're at dinner and he's like, you know, we're thinking we're batting ideas back and forth. And he goes, why don't you use Blackberries or barcodes to provide information on houses? And I said, I don't know about Blackberries or barcodes. This is before the QR code. Yeah. Um, Which we can debate if what the benefits of QR codes, if you want. But uh, this is before the QR code. And I said, I don't know about Blackberries or barcodes, but what about text messaging where you text in, you get info on a house, and then that, or you get texted back photos of the house and info on the house. And then the realtor gets sent a lead. They get your phone number. And he's like, yeah, that would work. So he gave me a free apartment. Uh, that he, you know, he owned in a, a few condos. Mm-hmm. He gave me a, a place to stay. And for that, he got 25% of the company, which was a bad decision. And it caused <laughs> rips down the road. Oh. But that's all he did. He just gave me a place and, and a couple bucks, very small amount of money. And I uh, was on unemployment, collecting unemployment checks. And I created this thing called House for Sell. And House for Sell was really the first you see them now, you still kind of see them now if you drive around, text in for info on this house. We were the first ones that did that. And I quickly learned how much I hate realtors. Uh, <laughs> my parents are realtors. I love my parents, but realtors in general are either fat and happy. So why would I buy your service? Mm-hmm. You know, I'm killing it. Or too broke to afford $29.99 a month. Or they try to haggle you on that stupid $29.99 and you waste all this time haggling. Yep. So we, when we came out with House for Sale, the company was called Sellix, C-E-L-L-I-T. When we came out with House for Sale, I knew I wanted to be bigger than House for Sale. Um, so I came out, I was dating a woman in Chicago at the time. I had lived in Chicago prior to San Diego. And I'd go to Chicago and I'd walk down the streets and I'd see all these restaurants and bars, lots of bars in Chicago. And I'd say, why don't we do a text messaging platform to send out drink alerts and happy hour Smart. special, you know, all that stuff. So that became something called Coupon Zap. Um, and Coupon Zap uh, and House for Sale quickly pivoted. I thought I'd be going after small restaurants and bars. My clients became Abercrombie and Fitch, Toys R Us, Sam's Club. Wow. Um, and then for House for Sale, yeah, we sold real estate, but our main client was For Rent Magazine, which is like, it used to be, I think it is still a pretty big deal. You'd go to the grocery store, you'd see this like booklet. And um, you could then text in for info on any of those houses. So we had a corporate deal with with, uh, For Rent, Chicago Tribune, All Tribune Papers, Marie Claire Magazine. So the business totally took off in a way that luckily I could have never imagined. And then we sold that company in 2014. So I, I sold the company in 2012 and then stuck with them for two years until 2014 is what's called an earnout, which is when you sell a company, you have to stick with the um, company for a while to (laughs) to transition it. So I sold it to a company called Hello World, which is now part of Merkel, um, which is like a huge data analytics processing company. Um, And worked for them for two years and they were fine. um, But That is a very difficult, I could have a full two hour discussion with you on the emotional misery you go during an earnout. 
Because what happens is, well, A, the, the plus side is hopefully you end up with a pile of cash in your pocket. Yeah. That's great. The downside is you have to sit there and it's almost as if you bought, my favorite car would be like a 62 uh, Corvette. Ooh, um, love it. Yeah. Prior to the Stingray look, you're talking, mm-hmm. uh, you're talking porthole windows, all that stuff. Imagine buying a 62 Vet and just renovating the hell out of it, making it as good as new, putting the, you know, the, the cherry red on there and all yeah. that, or candy apple red. And then you sell it and the person that buys it is your next door neighbor. So you can't help but see that car every day. <laughs> just like you decide working on that business for uh, eight years, seven, eight years before you sell it, you, you know, you're, you're making this, polishing this candy apple red business of sell it for seven years. You sell it to your next door neighbor. You can't help but watch it. And what do they do? They put it up on jacks and take a sander to it. Uh, yeah. It's like, yep, that would be tough. You know, it's like this, you know, you're just grabbing your hair for two years and your face and you're biting your, biting your fingernails off and just in misery as they destroy your life's work. Yeah. yeah that, that, that would be uh, very tough. Yeah. So uh, poor little rich kid, right? Like, so, okay. <laughs> so they destroy your business, but there is something, there is something there. So um, what, what happened was we built a very successful business. Uh, the text messaging. So the business went through changes with the iPhone. Um, I thought the iPhone would kill us. The iPhone came out in about 2008. Mm-hmm. It actually helped us because it introduced like tenfold increase in text messaging. I thought <laughs> apps and notifications would kill us, but it just increased yeah. everything. We also did build apps. Like we built the iPhone app for Auto Trader and uh, um, for Rent and, and all these. Hey, we, we, big, big we, brands. You know, we, pivoted. we pivoted. We did well. But um, what I realized with the messaging side is I helped create a monster. Because now the average consumer is getting inundated with text messages, just like they are getting. And everything we did was opt-in. So I don't want you to think we're spamming. Everything oh, yeah, was yeah. text into join, text into join, text out if you don't want it. It was all opt-in. I couldn't sleep at night if it wasn't. But um, we helped create a monster in that, um, you know, now people are getting thousands of text messages a day on top of the 150 to 300 emails a day. Um, and then there's Slack. <laughs> and Twitter, and Facebook, uh-huh. and Telegram, and, you know, you name it, uh, uh, Instagram, and everything else, uh, Skype. So what I realized is everybody's getting inundated with electronic communication. It's all becoming noise. So when I left Sell It, I wanted to send all my notes something that, all my employees something that, and clients something that wasn't electronic. So I sat down with a pen and paper, and I started writing handwritten notes. because. I saw that people, my salespeople in particular, but anybody in my office that had received a handwritten note, not only read it, but kept it on display. Uh So it was, it's savored and treasured more than read and thrown away or just thrown away without being read. So I sent handwritten notes to uh, most of my, to all my uh, employees and I kept trying to send it to all my clients, but you know, your handwriting starts sucking or you are, um, you get distracted yep. or you drop a note and have to redo it and it becomes expensive and you don't have the time and your hand cramps, you run out of stamps, whatever it is, your best, um, your best intentions kind of fall by the wayside as you realize this is just not doable and you try to think there has to be a better way. And so the day after I left Sell It, I started handwritten. And handwritten, my new company, is all about bringing back the importance of handwritten notes. We do it with robots, but our mission is not so much to use robots. It's to tell companies and individuals that they have to send handwritten notes, that handwritten notes in this day and age where I have to take my phone off because I'm interrupt my my watch off because I'm interrupted so much by <laughs> yeah. notifications on my wrist that I have to throw my watch across the room. Um, What people crave and what really sets your business apart from somebody else's business is when you show, when you show attention, when you set aside three to five minutes of your time and sit down and write a handwritten note, something that's perceived as unscalable. 
Handwritten, my company makes that scalable. But whether you do it with us or you do it in another way, the act of sending somebody a penned note um, cuts through the clutter. It has a 300% higher open rate versus a printed piece. Uh, redemption rates are through the roof of offers if you include an offer code. Um, we work with one bespoke clothing brand out of Canada that has coupon redemption rates of 18% versus 3% of other coupons. Wow, they send that's out. huge. Yeah. So um, all these, but forget about coupons and ROI. It's about um, differentiating and creating loyal customers in an age where there's no loyalty and everything's generic and um, everybody's just spamming you with email and text and everything else. So that's why, you know, th that's my long winded answer on why I'm here doing what I'm doing. Yeah, no, I love it. I love the history. I mean, you're, you're definitely a, an entrepreneur at heart. I mean, that's uh, a lot of ups and downs. I mean, like every good journey is, but I mean, to your point, it would be tough to raise your child for eight years and then pass them off to someone else and watch someone else raise them essentially. And that's what kind of, that business, yeah. Uh, yeah, that that would be extremely tough. But no, and I love what you're doing with this because I I agree with you. I mean, you don't focus on the ROI, you don't focus on the revenue, you focus on differentiating yourself and how you can bring value to a customer. Those other numbers they'll come. You focus on trying to to stand out am amongst your competition, and the ROI will definitely will definitely come in. Um, you know, one thing that that I've kind of seen people would ask, you know. You, it's great to have the handwritten note, but does the robot side of it and all that take the kind of personalization and that that heartfelt um, gesture out of it? Or I don't think so because I you're you're thinking about the message. It's not it's not sitting down and actually writing it. It's what you want to communicate and and you know coming up with a different way to communicate. But I mean, if someone were to you know ask you that, does that take the personalization away? I mean, what would be kind of your response to that? So um, I joke that, you know, Hallmark's tagline is when it's good enough to send the very best. Handwritten's fake tagline or joke tagline is when it's almost good enough to send the very best because the, sending the very best would be sitting down and writing a handwritten note mm -hmm. for real. Um, but I will say nobody will know. You know, it's your little secret with us. That's why you go to handwritten.com. You don't see any customer names. I mean, you see some people's names, but no, yeah. no clients' names is because we have a strict confidentiality. But nobody will know. It's still a piece that people, even if they do know, like if you received a birthday card from Barack Obama or now Donald Trump, do you really think Donald Trump wrote his name on that? <laughs> or No, it's written by some auto pen or whatever and sent to you. and. Uh, if I was, you know, the one of the mattress companies that we work with or whatever, and and I didn't use our service, do you think the CEO would sit down and write 5,000 handwritten notes? Or do you think they pass it off to lackeys, you know, some $12 intern to do it? Yeah. And if that's the case, what's the difference? You know, it's not the actual person, but the actual person did sit down and craft the note and say, I want to send this something special to this person. And that's all that matters. So, and then again, it depends on the industry. Uh, but, you know, like, like if you're in a sales organization, you could set up the note to be so custom that the, the messaging is, you know, they'll read that and they will have no doubt. But the actual physical note itself, um, unless I said to you, hey, what did you think of that robot written note? If I said, hey, <laughs> what do you think of that note? You'd be like, oh, I loved it. That was so thoughtful. I really appreciate you taking the time to write me a note. And then if I say, hey, what did you think of that robot written note? Or could you tell that note was written by a robot? Maybe you'd put it under additional scrutiny, but um, nobody will know. Yeah. I mean, our system, it is written in pen. It passes the smudge test. We worked with a uh, very large travel online travel agency, one of the largest out there. And we did a big campaign for them. And their response from their customers was, wow. I couldn't believe you took the time to send me a note. I licked my finger and the ink smudged. I was blown away. Wow. So, you know, they, the, the handwriting passed muster, the ink passed muster. Uh, it really does resonate with people. So, no, I, I love it. And I, I agree with all your points. Um, and 
So how does this work? If I'm a business and I want to use your service, do I have to go out and find addresses? Does it attach to, I mean, we were talking about CRMs before the call, do, do, do you integrate with CRMs or how, how does it work? How do I actually send these to people? What does that process look like? Yeah, so you can log into handwritten.com, our website, and it's handwritten with a Y, so H-A-N-D-W-R-Y-T-T-E-N uh, dot com. And you can send one note there. Um, you can't, you would have to provide the address for the note. Um, we also have bulk upload spreadsheets where you, and there's videos that walk you through that on our site where you can upload 10,000 orders at once and you get discounts, you know, based on the order size. Mm -hmm. But smallest order in our system is one. Um, in addition to that, we have integration with uh, salesforce.com where and HubSpot a CRM. So within those platforms, you can click a button. It will automatically populate the address information, all that for you, and then record that activity after you send the note back to the timeline of uh, the record in those CRM systems. Um, we integrate with Zapier. So that opens up possibilities for no, everything. Um, everything. Uh, we also now integrate with something called Integromat. Uh -huh. which is like a Zapier competitor. I don't know if you've seen that one yet. It's oh, yeah. High yeah, they uh, we use ClickUp internally for project management, and they're a pretty big partner there. And it's a little above my head, but yeah, they're they're definitely a, a competitor, but I think there's a lot more connectors and definitely a lot more value there. I think it's if you're very tech savvy, that yep. might be the route you go. Yeah. Um, it is robust. So we integrate with Integromat. We're, we're in their, their app platform. Uh, and then we also um, integrate with a full API. Uh, we are coming out with a Shopify integration as well. You don't need it because you can just use Zapier or Integromat, yeah. but um, it's more about the exposure that we get by having these additional uh, custom integrations than the integration itself. It's kind of a great SEO tool. Um, so yeah, so any of those platforms we integrate directly with, it pulls over the address data. We um, automate the process end to end. And you can actually, you know, with us, we've got a hundred plus designs of handwritten card of, of sorry of cards to choose from, or you can actually go on handwritten.com, create your own card, and then it's available via Shopify, Zapier, you know, uh, uh, Salesforce.com. Oh, and then we have iPhone and Android apps too. So um, if you were to go on handwritten.com, create a card design, when you log into your uh, handwritten iPhone app or Android app, that design would be there just for you to use. And then we have 21, I want to say, handwriting styles to choose from. Wow. In, in addition to those, you can create your own. It's expensive, but then that would be in your account just for you. Um, in addition to, we think the card is the gift. The card is the intention. The card is the attention span. Um, the card is the gift. However, if you want to add to the card, you can add a gift card to Amazon, uh, Starbucks, um, Home Depot, if you're a realtor, we do a lot yeah. of those for realtors. We're adding some higher end brands like Ruth's Chris Steakhouse, that type of thing. And then we can also insert your business card. So it's about creating these, you know, very personal direct to consumer message relationships. No, that's uh, that's really awesome. And and with all the, the CRM integrations, I mean, can you pull over different fields to make it personable? I know that you know, you're really big on personalization. We're huge on on that personalization piece. And so how, is that doable? And how, what does that look like? Is it just that integration? It's, oh, it's easy. Um, within Zapier, it's super, super easy because Zapier is such a slick user interface that when you get to the message field, you just pull in those little, you hit the little plus in the upper right and you pull in the the, the tags. And, and you could do the same thing with uh, Integromat. Um, with our API, you can do it too, obviously. API, you can do whatever the heck you want. Um, within handwritten.com, uh, or sale, well, within handwritten.com, we do have a couple of custom fields you can insert. Or if you do a bulk spreadsheet upload, you would. we have a very robust spreadsheet formula that handles uh, insert, inserting data fields for you. So that's all automatic too. Um, within salesforce.com, uh, there is um, what's called uh, uh, mail merge field integration. Uh -huh. You could do it there. HubSpot, not so much, but uh, it kind of reverts back to uh, handwritten.com for that. But but yeah, you could do it with on all the platforms very easily. Uh, and if you have any problems doing it, you just let our customer support know and they're able to assist you there. No, that's awesome. Um, so I guess a use case, this is something that we're thinking through with a the client. They're uh, an apparel company. What we want to do is, 
uh, they they use WooCommerce, um, which integrates yeah. with Zapier. So would love to do something where if it's their first time purchase using the CRM, take a first time purchaser, then send them yeah. a, a handwritten note saying thank you. Here's an additional ten dollars off, whatever that may look like. But it's yeah. expediting that second purchase and overall increasing that lifetime value of a customer. Exactly. Yeah. So I was I was uh, for your listeners, I was pointing at you because that's exactly what we do. What we do <laughs> is we just do it within uh, Zapier using filter by Zapier. So you pull in the Shopify or the WooCommerce record and you say, uh, only send this to people on their first transaction or after their total transaction value hits a threshold, like after they hit 500 bucks or a thousand bucks or five orders or anniversary of order, whatever that is, you set up all those transactions within Zapier to do and it's super easy and it makes these crazy cool flows. We are creating a Shopify integration right now to kind of do that on a very transparent, easy to use mm-hmm. level, but um, you can do it all within Zapier. And uh, we're also going to be rolling out something specific to the automotive vertical, which is handles all that for you too. So that's cool. For automotive, the idea is um, you just pay us 15 bucks a, a car customer per year and we handle everything. So um, when somebody buys a car, you, you send us 15 bucks. We will send them a thank you for purchase card, followed by a service reminder card, you know, six months later, followed by a happy birthday card, followed by a um, a happy holidays card. And then the following year, they'll get a anniversary of purchase card, holiday card, service reminder, birthday card. So it is a re- recurring cycle for just 15 bucks. And once we get it figured out for automotive, then we're going to roll that out to any That's- personalized selling initiative, whether it's real estate or insurance or Wealth management, you know, it's the same thing. You want to stay in touch with them four times a year. So that's that's what it is. No, I love it. I mean, and that's how you guys are going to see tons of opportunity come in because it's one thing to to give the tool. Um, yeah, this all sounds good, but how do I go in there? What does the right workflow look like? What's the cadence? Do I need to uh, reach out to people? What does that messaging look like? And if you guys are being proactive and helping on that end, not only just on a, a overall perspective, but by vertical, I think that's where it's it, there's going to bring a ton of value to people and make that aha moment happen. Cause it's like, you can tell someone about your platform and yeah, that all sounds cool. But once you bring the use case and how it could actually work on the oil changes, this, the, I mean, once you actually show them how it works, that that aha moment happens. And it's like, yeah, that, that sounds good. Let's, let's move forward. So that's, yeah, that's the problem with our platform is right now it's like, well, how much is it? And you're like, well, it's this dollar per, you know, X dollars per note. And they say, okay, and great. Love it. But then they, then it's on them to think of, Oh, mm-hmm. what do I send? What do I send now? What do I send now? And I want to get rid of all that and just make it a turnkey community uh, follow-up platform. Um, and and that's that's kind of where we're headed. There's a couple things ahead of us in the queue for that, but it'll certainly be available in 2021. That that's awesome. And even with your background, I mean, outside of this, it, it sounds like you're you're huge again on that personalization. But the uh, the one to one messaging rather than one to many more like TV broadcast where you have a message that goes yeah. out to everyone. It's more one-to-one. Um, so with your experience, I mean, especially now, it's more important than ever to humanize your brand and create that relationship. I mean, what are some tips that you have for businesses on on how they can create that relationship? Well, number one, I mean, with COVID going on, the conference, you know, a lot of businesses rely on conferences to get new clients and those are gone, you know? so. Um, I think handwritten notes that not from us, I'm, you know, I am preaching the value of a handwritten note. So, um, handwritten notes go a long way to remind clients that you still care about them. So it is a check-in handwritten note, just saying, you know, it's been a while since we've spoken. I hope everything's okay. It's a thank you for your purchase. And then off, obviously you can also do offers in addition to handwritten notes. I mean, picking up the phone and just not with a script just with a, hey, wanted to check in is mm-hmm. so important. Setting up webinars is so important or podcasts where, you know, you can just stay in, stay top of mind with these brands is so, is so, so much more important now than ever before. You know, there's a lot of people at home that are alone because they're no longer working in an office. They're working out of their home and they're scared and they're anxious. And yeah, you're a brand selling them something at the end of the day, whether it's a 
handwritten note software or an advertising or a new car, whatever, but you're still saying, Hey, I care. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, um, I wouldn't send you a handwritten note if I didn't care. So, um, that goes a long way. And I think it's going to go a lot longer way today than it did six months, six months ago. Isn't it crazy? It's already six months. Yeah. It's, it's, it's bonkers. And the fact that I have people around my office having conversations about, Oh, I love your mask. Oh, your mask. Where did you get that? I mean, it's insane, (laughs) but, uh, but, uh, yeah, but this is the world we live in and, and people need connection and and handwritten notes are, are a nice way to do that. Um, we have a client. They've been a client for a few years. I had no idea what they did. Um, I thought they were a law firm with the name of the, the company. It turns out what they are is a piano tuning company out of huh. Pennsylvania. Uh, and they go in people's homes once a year and tune their piano. And then they have a zap your zap set up to automatically send them a handwritten thank you right after they tune their piano. And then, you know, a year later, they go in and tune the piano again. The owner of the company said when he goes back into those homes to tune the piano a year later, their handwritten note from the year before is still on the refrigerator. So, you know, people see the value in this. And like I said, it's not about using our services, just about making that, getting that intention, intention and attention to get out there and send handwritten notes. No, I love it. And I mean, to your point, it's everyone's getting more digital, more digital. And it's, uh, trying to find those other channels to where you can kind of break through that, that noise. And even now, I mean, outside of the economics and everything that COVID's causing, I mean, the, the mental side of thing, I think is something that we won't even know the impacts for, for a while. But um, to your point right now, your, your service is probably the most beneficial with everyone being at home much longer. Um, You know, people are, are, they'll be able to see it a bit more. Things are slowing down. And so to create that personal connect, like right now is such a huge opportunity for that, that creating that connection, one, to make sure that you know, everyone is staying safe and staying sane, but two, to to actually be seen and get your message in front of an audience that you want to get in front of. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's 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 crazy times out there right now. But uh, but yeah, I, I, I obviously couldn't agree more. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, yeah. I wouldn't be doing this business for six years. Right. And I mean, with all this digital communication, I mean, is there one or even all forms of communication? I mean, is there one that you see that really sticks out or that that really captures someone's someone's attention? Any particular channel? Um, no, because there's so many there, there there's there's people are inundated. You know, I have people in my office come to me saying, yeah, I'm just following up from that slack I sent you. And I'm like, what? You know, I haven't looked through the 50,000 little green dots on my Slack sidebar to determine, you know, that you sent me. People are inundated. And I mean, I have people that I know that say, if you want to get me, don't email me, text me or call me. So I do think, you know, in certain situations, texting and phone calls are are your best bet uh, because getting through the din is just impossible. So uh, I know there's some platforms out there like Slidial that allow you to drop voicemails on people's phone it's a little sneaky but um Hmm. that might be a way to communicate it's it's just going to get harder and harder um with with the ease of automation you know two years ago we started using a platform called persist iq which is like uh uh reply.io there's a few of them out there where it's like a sales automation email where it's not like a mailchimp which is a newsletter it's like a one-to-one style email that comes supposedly from me to you and back then it was a very novel thing. Now I get them like five times a day where it's like <laughs> checking in. Did you receive my last email? And I'm like, stop spamming me, dude. Um, so, you know, the, it's just getting more and more and more and it's all just mattering less and less and less. So I think old school things like picking up the phone, sending a text, sending a handwritten note are all great ways to get in front. Um, yeah. Yeah. And he, I, I couldn't agree more. And and when it comes to, I mean, you've been part of many different businesses. You've been doing this one for a while. I mean, what's been the biggest struggle or hurdle that you've you've faced? I mean, um, really growing this business and, and how'd you overcome it? So both businesses, I'll, I'll I'll give you a tale of two businesses. So sell it, I was dirt broke. And um I sat in a room for two years in Scottsdale, Arizona with a 
like classic stereotypical startup. Me, uh, a, a crummy Dale com- Dell computer, and a two liter bottle of Diet Mountain Dew by my side, and I programmed all day long. That's how stupid it was. But but that's what we got uh, hand uh, sell it off the ground. And so the issue there was access to capital, just being able to hire people, and we didn't like I my sales guy, my first sales guy, who's fantastic. In fact, I want him to work for me now, but uh, he's traveling the world. He's in Vietnam and everything else. Wow. Uh, he he worked for me for commission only because he knew the value and what we were offering, and he made a ton of money commission only. So he really helped me get the business off the ground. Um, and then when we got a call one day, so we were doing these onesie twosie real estate deals and, then we, and, and, you know, bars and strip clubs and whoever used coupons app at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, then we got a call from Marie Claire magazine that just blew us up. Hmm. Um, and then that, that was it. So it was really just access to capital with handwritten. It's very different. Um, handwritten is now six years old. The first three years was me, A, I had just sold another company. And then when I started handwritten, I also met a woman and we got married like four months later. And and I was not in the mental space to focus entirely on handwritten at the time. So we, I, we bought these auto pens, which are kind of off the shelf writing devices. And we uh, used those to write the handwritten notes for the first year to two years two years and i realized the company behind the auto pen uh, the guy that owns it is a nice guy but very nice guy very very nice guy but the company structure and his disorganization made it impossible to scale my business because they were kind of the only available option out there and at first i could only buy four robots four auto pens and that's not enough (laughs) yeah that's business right now i have 95 and wow. That's, that's not enough. So we, we went from four and then I had to play some BS games to get to eight by forming fake shell companies. And <laughs> it was a mess. He knew that he was selling to me, but internal politics and everything else with his organization, we did that. Gotcha. Uh, and in addition to the, the devices, access to the devices not working, the devices themselves were not use were not as uh effective as what i have now i want to be careful because he's a nice guy with a good product but not what we needed yeah so uh if you were writing the same note over and over again they would be fine however because you would just kind of line everything up you move your little guides on the paper you put the paper in and it would work you know it would work fine but if anything changed on that note or the paper size changed it was a disaster. And um, he's just like, oh, I'll just move it over a little bit this way, move it over <laughs> that way. And that's, it just doesn't, that doesn't scale. You can't scale. So, um, and then also every time we wanted a new handwriting style or a new signature, he'd uh, rake us over the coals because he needed to make a profit. So I said, you know what? Screw it. We got to come out with our own robot. Mm-hmm. And I had no idea how to do that. But what I did was um, it took us three years um, two, eh, two, two to three years. And we had one false start where we hired a guy off Upwork, uh, which is like one of these freelancer sites. Mm-hmm. He had a background. He worked for JPL, Jet Propulsion Lab. So the guys that literally, his day job was making a rocket to <laughs> land on a meteor and drill into the meteor and bring back a sample. So I'm like, he, that, that, not, that's that's, that's my guy. <laughs> well, it turns out he was a stoner and he was not my guy. And uh, I got back something that didn't work. And then I found another guy who said, well, I can't do this, but I'll introduce you to a consulting firm, the best you'll ever find. And they turned out to be based in Phoenix. And I was already in Phoenix at the time. And they provided us a robot. And what was interesting was uh, I did all the software. So I wrote the user interface and the, the drawing but I needed a machine that could feed the paper. Um, that turned out to be a very big issue to, to scalability. So um, we met, they provided us a robot. That robot, um, and I want to be conscious of your time because I could go on forever, but that robot turned out to cost eight grand to build uh, in quantity, which was the same price as these auto pens. 
Oh, that's so no brainer. I mean, I was like, this is great. And then after they handed over that robot, we, I brought in a kid from ASU um, whose background was remote control cars and 3d printing. He huh. uh, tinkered with both of those and he was an electric or he was a mechanical engineer and we trained him up. I had the engineers, the consultants train him on how to build these. And then he'd come to my office. And the reason the remote control cars was important was um, the, the pen lifter that moved the pen up and down was on a servo, the exact same servo used in an RC car. So I was like, well, this guy seems to have a pretty good background for this. So then he came into my office and he said, you know, that big metal box on the front of the robot that holds the electronics that costs you 400 bucks, uh, we could 3D print that. And I said, okay, well, how much is a 3D printer? He said, I think it's about $500. I said, oh, that's interesting. And I said, and how much would it cost to 3D print that box? He said, let me check on that. He came back to my office 20 minutes later, $7. <laughs> no brainer. So I'm like, do that. Get one of those. So we started 3D printing more and more parts using an off-the-shelf Amazon CR10S 3D printer. That printer to start was fine, but we quickly realized it was not production grade and mm -hmm. the machine started working out. But it got us off the metal. And the problem with the metal was not only did I have to buy 10 machines at once to get the cost down to $8,000 each. So yeah. then I'm laying out 80 grand to build these robots every time. I couldn't change designs easily. I'd have to you know, be super, super careful. And then we'd have to ship off for 20 parts at a time or 10 parts. It was, it, was it was very, very expensive to change. And it would take a lot of time because we'd have to wait for the fat, the CNC shops to do it on all that. Versus when we moved to 3D printing, we could literally draw out a part freehand, print it out in 10 minutes, try it out, see if it worked, and move on. So what we did was we moved from CNC to 3D printing. And then from 3D printing, uh, we, we overdid 3D printing where we were 3D printing flat pieces. So I was having a team meeting and I'm like, you know, this is great, but it is taking way too long to spit out a printer, uh, a handwriting robot. Uh, what else could we do? And we, we racked our brain. We came up with a number of things. We ended up buying a laser cutter. So now in our facility, we have a laser cutter, we have 3D printers, and we're able, we brought the cost of building the robot down from $8,000 to about $2,500. It's huge. Uh, and we're able to turn them around much faster. They're much better. It's just a way better machine than we could buy. So we're very vertically integrated now. One room, we build robots. The next room, we put the robots to work. Um, it's super geeky. Uh, anybody in Arizona, if COVID's no, not going on, feel free to stop by and you can see it for yourself. But uh, yeah, so, and what happened was uh, we moved. So when we started, in Arizona, and we put in our first little office, we had enough orders to fill that office. And then we bought a bigger, we leased a bigger office, about twice as much. When you know it, we got enough orders to fill that office. Then we doubled wow. again, and we got enough orders to fill that office. So I'm not woo-woo thinking, you know, if you build it there, we'll come. But there is something about having the space and the capacity that drives business. Uh, and then when we built the robots, we created the capacity, you know, now we have 95 robots, we could keep building them, but business is flattened due to the, due to the pandemic. Um, by having that capacity, the business came. Yep. So uh, again, I'm not spiritual. I'm not running around with sage, you know, saging everything <laughs> in the office, but, but there is, there is a piece of that that matters. So now we're expanding again. We're going from 7,000 square feet to about 14,000. Uh, nice. And we're just going to keep pumping this thing. Uh, so the big challenge in this business has been the initial technology. And, and now we're, we're pretty good. I mean, it's now we're facing whole new, you know, and as you grow, you face new issues. So, um, you know, we're pumping out thousands, you know, on an average day, 5,000 notes a day. And wow. when you do that, there's QA issues and you, your QA team gets fatigued looking at hundreds of notes a day, you know, each. So we're now using machine learning, computer vision, to QA the notes. And so that's a whole new thing. So it's just 
you know, we take an engineering approach to these problems and it's, it's been a lot of fun, way more complicated business than, the, than sell it. Like tech, <laughs> text messaging compared to this is like orders of magnitude more complicated. But I'm sure it's more fulfilling. And even then it's, I, I mean, you seem to be a serial entrepreneur. I'm sure that the stuff you're learning, the robots, the 3d printing, all the stuff that you're learning from that. I mean, from this, how you figured out how to bring costs down and, and be able to scale, you're going to create like five or six more businesses from this, from the technology you're creating in house. I mean, it... I don't know. We'll see. I'm getting a little gray, a little gray hairs popping up. So we'll, we'll see. But yeah, I mean, that's, you know, an entrepreneur, there's a definite definition of an entrepreneur, which is like takes the resources that, and I should Google it right now. They take the resources they have and do more with them. You know, so you can be I an like entrepreneur it. at an existing company and drive, hey, we've been doing this this way for 50 years. Let's not do that. Let's do it this way. Now you're an entrepreneur. And that's what I try to do is that we try to, you know, we try to do more with the resources we have. And uh, yeah, that's the fun part. And, you know, like yesterday, we plopped in a new sensor into some of the robots to handle, uh, to better handle out of paper notifications and stuff like that. And now when the machine's out of paper, the wheels don't spin burning up um, polyurethane on the wheels. And I'm like, this is great. It's saving the wheels. We're not getting like rubber uh, eraser dust everywhere. Yeah. You know, um, and so like little things like that really, really light my fire. So it's hmm. been a lot of awesome. You guys are growing. I mean, that's a, that's a lot of handwritten notes a day um, for the next three to six months. I mean, how are you guys marketing yourselves? How are you guys getting out there? How are you guys, uh, continuing that growth. I know you mentioned there's a plateau, but sure that that you're going to get over that here soon. I mean, what are you guys doing in that sense? Yeah. So, uh, to what you do, we do, a, we've just started dipping our toe in Facebook advertising. We, for the longest time we've been doing Google ads and Google is fine, but it's only uh, attracting users that want your service, which is, you know, a lot of people want yeah. your service, but when you're in, there's something called the BCG matrix, Boston Consulting Group matrix, which basically says you have four different types of, uh, if you were to visualize a four box quadrant, because consultants always visualize four <laughs> box quadrants, on one side you have um, uh, customers. You have existing customers at the bottom and new customers at the top. And then on the other, on the other uh, axes, you have products, existing products and new products. So, the easiest thing to do is sell an existing product to an existing customer. Yep. If you're an office supply store, people come in all the time, you sell them pens. They're already your customer, you just sell them pens. Easy. We're a small company, so we don't have any existing clients, relatively speaking. I mean, we do, but now we do. But, but we're selling a new product to new clients. That is the hardest thing you can do. And when you're selling new products, you can't rely on Google ads because nobody's going to be searching for Thank robotically written handwritten notes. So... Now we're using face, Facebook more than LinkedIn, even because LinkedIn's so darn expensive. Uh -huh. Yeah. But every business owner and business manager is also a consumer on Facebook. So we're nailing Facebook. Mm -hmm. And um, that's drop, driven our cost per acquisition uh, in half almost. Oh, that's huge. Uh, yeah. So we're doing that. We're improving our videos. We could probably use your help for doing better videos on the Facebook ads. Um, and so that's, that's a big push. What we try to do is if you visit our website, you hit the business page, you'll see sample kits that you can order free of charge. And we're driving people to those sample kits because once they get our samples, they see how amazing it is and then they sign up. So, um, so that's, that's kind of our number one thing um, is Facebook advertising uh, we're also deep into search engine optimization and content marketing. Um, and now we're starting webinars and maybe, you know, you and I talk after this about doing a joint webinar because that would be, uh, that'd be cool. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not so much about, again, like I've tried, I'm trying to get better at it. I'm, <laughs> I'm not a sales guy. I'm just passionate about what I do. Mm -hmm. I don't want to sell handwritten with a Y. I want to sell handwritten cards with an I, you know, actual handwritten cards. If you use us great, if you don't use us fine, but we need to get out there and be the thought leaders um, just like Tesla is out there pushing the, the, the change to electrification of cars. Yes, they're selling Tesla cars, but really their mission is to push electrification of cars. Our mi mission is to push 
more handwritten notes and deeper personalized relationships with customers. So that's that's what I you know what we're going to be doing with our uh, webinar series. Yeah, no, I, I love it. I can definitely hear the passion, and that's uh, that's you know what problem you're solving, and and that's huge. And and you don't really have to come out and sell. I mean, just show the passion will help show the value that you bring, and, and the sales will come. Um, should maybe check out YouTube uh, pre-roll ads. I mean, if you're if you're running video ads, you can run ads in front of a competitor's YouTube channel, their videos. But I mean, you can hit the marketing, uh, people are in service for marketing and really the education piece on how it works and how this cuts through the noise. I mean, YouTube's been doing a big, big push to create more direct response marketing. And so it might be a channel worth worth testing if you're if you're seeing some success on uh, Facebook. Um and it's super cheap. I mean, have you seen those ones where you can skip in thir- or five seconds or whatever? Yeah, yeah. It, those literally, if someone skips, you're not charged anything. You're only charged if someone watches 30 seconds or more of the video, and you're looking at like two to three cents uh, a view. And then you can retarget the people that watch it, similar to Facebook and a bunch of other stuff. But there, there's a ton of white space. Um, and that, I mean, I like nerding out quite a bit. I mean, OTT, I don't know if you've like connected TV. I that might be. Done yeah. You've done that? I, we have a, a partner that, um, I mean, it's similar to like Google ads and Facebook ads, but I mean, essentially you could retarget people on your website and serve them a TV ad. If they're watching like sling TV or ESPN or YouTube TV through like, uh, um, it's the cord cutting, um, people, yeah. which is, it's a huge growing demographic for, you know, the, uh, a little bit older, older demographic. Um, those decision makers, I mean, um, there, there could be a ton of opportunity there, but I always happy to, uh, I mean, chat if you yeah. ever have any questions there but um that's no really i love cool. that you guys are getting into it i mean uh that's it's I, I can't wait to see what you guys do i mean you guys have an awesome solution and so it'll be fun to walk kind of watch the growth and yeah thank you man uh yeah we're, we'll have a discussion after this call uh for sure um but yeah that's that's kind of it um so that's cool. As we kind of wrap up, I mean, you you have tons of knowledge. You've been doing quite a bit. I mean, if there's someone that's just starting their own business or trying to dabble into the entrepreneurship, I mean, what's, I guess, the biggest piece of advice that you can give someone? Um, yeah, so uh, there's, number one, there's a book that really hit it home for me. And mm-hmm. it's, it's an older book called The E-Myth by Michael Gerber. It's a pamphlet of a read. I mean, you can pound through it in, in two nights, maybe but it talks about working on your business versus working in your business. Um, And I fail at that sometimes. Like I should not be writing the code to handle a sensor in a paper feed mechanism that's working in your business, Mm -hmm. but I enjoy it. And that's the, the, the trap that entrepreneurs fall in. So um, you, it's, it's worth reading the emit. It's, it'll cost you 10 bucks and two nights of your, uh, of of read. Um, My advice would be twofold. Number one, um, I was fortunate enough in college to bring speakers to campus. That was like in a, a geeky group I was a part of. Mm-hmm. And we brought Conan O'Brien and he was actually quite oh. thoughtful. And this is back 20 years ago, you know, 25. Um, and he said, always get in over your head. And that is, you know, people give you advice every day, right? Like, but 25 years later, I'm still thinking about Conan O'Brien telling me always get in over my head. I mean, I we met with a lot of people being in that speaker group including Trump. Um, wow. but, but always get in over your head really stuck. So, um, yeah, I, I think always get in over your head. And then if another bit of advice would be, there's no better time to start a business than today. And the reason I say that is twofold. Number one, as you get older, you're just going to have more responsibilities, whether mm-hmm. that's a second house mortgage, a first house mortgage, children, a wife, a husband, whatever. There's always more and more and more and more and more. So if you start today, you can get in front of it a little bit. Um, number two, there's this aspect of analysis paralysis. If you've heard that term. Oh, yeah. So people, oh, I don't know. Should I start the business? Should I not? Like take me, for example, with the robots. Had I waited until I actually, to start handwritten, until I actually had my own robot, how many years would I have been set back? Yep. Right. So you just got to jump in and effing figure it out. I love and, it. And, and so that's, that's really important too. No, I, I absolutely love that. I mean, just even from a marketing perspective, working with clients, it's like, we spend so much time planning and prepping and all that. Let's just, let's just go like it, just that analysis paralysis is, uh, 
trying to strive for perfection, but it's like once, you know, get it there. Once you're in market, I mean, hate the learnings, but I think, uh, yeah, that's a huge piece of advice. I'm definitely gonna check out that book. Cause that's the biggest thing that is on my number one radar right now is, uh, I've been 110,000% working in the business, not on it and trying to yeah. do, uh, um, well, we can, I mean, like you mentioned the, the finances and all that, it, getting that working capital is tough, but you know, we're trying to grow, um, organically just bootstrapping it, not trying to trying to borrow yeah. so trying to grow a team and and which then allow me to work more on it so i'm gonna check out that book but yeah i mean outside of that i i really appreciate your time and i, I it's cool that you're here in phoenix i'd love to swing by and and check out the facility I, it would be cool really cool to see yeah absolutely i i, I just say please wait until after covid uh-huh. but after that, um yeah i mean we we have kids coming in here like stem stem kids um coming in here we we have, you know, we invite all our clients, prospects, anybody. I mean, we, we're very proud of what we've created here. And it's unique. You don't see oh, too yeah. many vertically integrated companies anymore. So, um, yeah, I would love to have you by and, and we'll see in touch for sure. And if any of your customer, your, your listeners want to try our service, just sign up on our website. Uh, don't use Facebook or Google to OAuth and just sign up and use discount code podcast and you'll get $5 in credit to use. Cool. Well, we'll include it in the show notes. And uh, so if someone d- does want to reach out to you or, or uh, sign up, how can they find you and how can they find the, the company? Yeah, so I'm on LinkedIn, David Wax, W-A-C-H-S, or just David Handwritten. I mean, I'm the only one. Uh, there's also um, our, our Facebook page, at, uh, Handwritten on Facebook, at Handwritten on Twitter, David B. Wax on Twitter, although I don't tweet that much. Um, as much as I should. Um, and then I occasionally write for Inc. Magazine. So if you search for my articles on Inc. Magazine, you can see those. That, that, that's awesome. And if you're listening to this, trying to find a different channel, a new channel to test, this is definitely one to test. And I would highly recommend going to check them out. So David, thank you so much for your time and uh, look forward to uh, staying in touch. You too. Thanks so much. Thank Pleasure. you.